Okay. Um, hey, everybody. So Randy Hedgepath is joining us tonight. He is the Tennessee, uh, the naturalist for Tennessee State Parks, and he will be giving us a photo tour of some good places to see birds and other wildlife in Middle Tennessee, as well as across the state. Um, so I'm going to go go ahead and hand it over to Randy, and you can take it away. Good evening, everyone. I'm glad you could join me. I got uh, some pictures of wildlife and some places where you can go to see wildlife uh, and some anecdotes and things like that that I can share with you. So I hope you enjoy our little tour tonight. I'm going to try to uh, keep it under an hour so that if you have any questions, uh, maybe we could have that after I get through showing all my pictures. Uh, I'm going to try to go to share screen now and, and start it out. Can everybody see the picture? Uh, yes. Yes. Great, great. Well, this is Real Foot Lake, probably the best place in Tennessee to go to see wildlife. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if, you, if you're traveling around on Real Foot Lake and you're a uh, John Boat or whatever, and you don't see any animals, you're probably not looking. Uh, mm -hmm. It is uh, teething with uh, all sorts of uh, uh, animals, uh, mainly birds. Uh, birds are everywhere, but uh, very important are the fish and the mammals and everything else too. Uh, let me see here. Including things that you might not think about. Uh, this little guy uh, I found on the edge of the swamp uh, next to uh, a road. You can see the road in the picture. Uh, he was ready to uh, take a hold to me, I think. Uh, crayfish here. Uh, we have several different kinds across the state. Their range is uh, limited. So you have a, a crayfish at Real Foot Lake that you won't have in East Tennessee, and you have one in East Tennessee you won't have at Real Foot Lake. So they're many and diverse, uh, those little crayfish. Yep, here we go. And if you look around uh, as you're traveling across the lake through the lily pads, Birds are all over the place. This is a picture of a great egret out there uh, walking among the lilies. The average depth of Real Foot Lake is five feet. There are places that are 15 or more feet deep, but it is a very large 20,000 acre and only five feet deep average. Uh, so it is teeming with wildlife. And I have seen uh, this scene, I include this slide, even though it's too dark, uh, to show you the sky there. All those little dots you see on the sky are snow geese. Snow geese by the thousands. Uh, yeah, put your hat on because <laughs> if you're under this group, uh, you might need a hat. Uh, snow geese are almost the size of a Canada goose. And I went out with my friend David Haggard, who's the West Tennessee Regional Naturalist to Black Bayou Wildlife Management Area, and the snow geese were circling here. And they would circle and then they would land down there in that field. And then they would get up and circle around again, down onto the field and up around and circle in again. And I said, David, what in the world? Why can't they make up their mind? Why don't they go ahead and land? And he said, well, there's probably a coyote over there in that woods and every time most of them land, he jumps out and goes, boo, and they always take off again. Uh, snow geese are not a prized game animal by any means, uh, but uh, snow geese are fun to watch. Speaking of watching, uh, one of the first things I did uh, in a park setting was during my sophomore year in college at UT Martin over in West Tennessee, I signed up for a two hour credit class where I went to Real Foot Lake and did some bird watching. We are not just watching any bird though, we have a specific one in mind. One that nearly disappeared from the earth, you might say. They were, they were getting really, really, really rare because of DDT making their eggshells so thin they couldn't raise babies. But there were a few hanging on in the Midwest and in the wintertime, they would come down to Real Foot Lake where the water was still liquid and they could catch fish, their favorite food, and give college students something to earn some credit hours with. 
we called it the Eagle Watch program, and these programs still go on today there at Real Foot Lake. Um, you can see our national symbol in great abundance now. Uh, back in the 1970s when I did my uh, little stint there, they were a little bit hard to find, but now they are easy to find. They are all over the roof of lake. There's several nests, and uh, they're all over the state, too. I have seen a bald eagle at Frozen Head, of all places. So just about anywhere in Tennessee, you near water, where their favorite food fish is located, you're, you're liable to see a bald eagle today. What a great recovery story that is. One of the great triumphs of conservation in America. Roof at Lake, we have several different uh, birds uh, in captivity. And the reason for that is they're injured and cannot be released. They would starve to death on their own. And we put them to work. We feed them fish out of the lake. Uh, those jumping carp are good uh, food for these birds. Uh, and we got about six eagles there and several other birds of prey. And we use them as educational tools. And kids with their eyes lighting up seeing these birds of prey makes all the work taking care of them worth it for sure. And we have a little little army of uh, seasonal naturalists and, and rangers there at Real Foot Lake that, that uh, take care of them. One of the things you can do to see some wildlife at Real Foot Lake is to take the pontoon boat tours, which are offered every day, just about, sometimes two or three a day. And here's Alicia getting uh, loosened up so that she can take you out on the boat and show you all the different wildlife you can see at Real Foot Lake. Uh, and you can see a lot. I'll learn to uh, how to turn this slide in a minute. Here we go around the cypress trees. Go out in the early morning and get a picture like the first slide with the sunrise or the late afternoon you get the picture with the sunset. Uh, the lake and the cypress trees, very picturesque. If you're a photographer and you can't get a good picture at Real Foot Lake, there's something wrong for sure because everywhere you look is a picture postcard. And we have some walking areas too. There are boardwalks all through uh, the state park area, which is a little bit of the uh, outside of the park and some uh, boardwalks at the National uh, Wildlife Management Area. The, how am I gonna say? Oh, the National Wildlife Area uh, on the north of the lake, uh, ten the Tennessee National Wildlife Refuge and the Real Foot Lake National Wildlife Refuge are among the, the National Wildlife Refuges in Tennessee. Let's go to Memphis now. Uh, where we have a little state park set aside for um, for an, kind of an unpleasant reason. Teal Fuller State Park was initiated because uh, the state of Tennessee in the 1930s would not allow certain citizens of Memphis to go to the state park because of their skin color. But the federal government says, we'll give you another park for that if you insist on separate but equal philosophy, we're gonna give you another park for the African-American citizens of Memphis. And T.O. Fuller came to be. But what a jewel we got for a bad reason. T.O. Fuller State Park uh, had a golf course uh, involved in the park there, but that golf course has been turned into a wildlife watching area. The trails where the golf uh, carts used to go uh, are now the trails you can walk to to look for birds and other wildlife in the wildlife area in Teal Fuller State Park. Down near the, the highway, there's a big pond and uh, otters have been seen there playing around. And I remember several years ago, I went to Teal Fuller and talked to a young ranger there. Uh, and she was telling me that I think we might have eagles here. As a matter of fact, some of our visitors have told me that we might have an eagle nest. And she had pulled on the side of the road across from this pond. And I looked up and, and above where we were sitting was the eagle nest. And she says, you know, uh, this person tells me that we might have an eagle, an eagle nest. And I said, uh, like that one? 
And she looked out, oh my God, there it is. And about that time, one of the eagles looked over the side of the nest, made it even more thrilling. So yes, an eagle's nest at Teal Fuller State Park as well. On up the side of the Mississippi River, we have a state historic park, which can be really good for wildlife watching as well. Fort Pillow, where uh, the Mississippi River comes down and makes a 90 degree turn at this big bluff of Luss, L-O-E-S-S, -S, that windblown glacial uh, dust from many years ago. Uh, the stuff that the glaciers ground up and the wind blew uh, on the prevailing west wind onto the east side of the river and caused us to have 200 foot uh, bluffs of dust, the Luss bluffs, the Chickasaw bluffs, so called because the Chickasaw people that claimed West Tennessee used them as their place to perch and uh, demonstrate their, their uh, control of the Mississippi River. One day I was walking at, T at uh, Fort Pillow and it was a hot summer day. I was enjoying the old trees along the trail. Everything was going great, but I was hot and sweaty and uncomfortable. And they have a lake, but uh, the lake was uh, not a place that you could go swimming or cooling off. So I went down below the dam. And below the dam, there was a pool of water just big enough for me to get in. So I prepared to do so. And I stepped in with one foot and I looked up and saw this guy on the other side. So my foot came back out and I said, excuse me, sir, I didn't know this was your pool. I guess I'll have to go elsewhere. This is one of the cottonmouth that live there and all over West Tennessee. I grew up with these seemingly behind every other tree. They are a venomous snake. They are not poisonous that I know of. I've never eaten one. I guess you'd, you'd have to eat it to make sure that it's poisonous or not. Uh, but uh, it is a venomous snake. And they get a bad reputation because uh, they sometimes get confused when they get scared and will travel in the easiest direction that they can and that might be toward you. They are not chasing you. They are just trying to get away and don't know that they're heading toward you. And the biggest rattlesnake that I have ever seen, another venomous uh, creature uh, of Tennessee, the biggest one that I've seen and gotten a picture of was at Fort Pillow State Historic Park. This is a picture that I took right outside of the visitor center in the parking lot. It was as big around as my lower leg uh, the only one that I've ever seen was bigger, uh, was one at Savage Gulf, which was as big around as my upper leg. And I count over there about uh, uh, the big one at Savage Gulf, I counted 18 rattles. I'm not sure how many are. I, I should have counted them before I showed the picture. But we have 23 different species of uh, the reptiles and snakes in Tennessee, and it's more in some areas, but uh, only 20 something species. That's not many to learn. And how many of those are venomous? Only three, or in West Tennessee, four. There's a dwarf or a little rattlesnake over in West Tennessee, uh, the um, timber rattler, and then the, the small one. In other parts of Tennessee, there are cottonmouth in West Tennessee, there are cottonmouth in Middle Tennessee up the Duck River all the way up to Old Stone Fort. I have had to back up from a, uh, getting in the water at Old Stone Fort in Manchester because of a cottonmouth there. They were surprised to hear that we had a cottonmouth there. Copperheads occur statewide. So if you uh, want to get away from the venom snakes, we only have the, the three main ones. You can go to East Tennessee and you get away from the cottonmouths completely. You have the copperheads and the timber rattlesnakes over in East Tennessee. One of the most unique experiences I believe that anybody could have uh, in Tennessee is a little thing called the Ghost River Canoe Trail. Uh, you put on to the Wolf River in your canoe and you paddle along for a few miles, then all of a sudden the river kind of just filters out through a forest and you have trees all around. If it wasn't marked, you probably would get lost like many people did before it was a marked trail through the forest there. You go for about a mile through the trees, sometimes just wide enough for your canoe, and emerge into a lake. And then you paddle across the lake. And magically, on the other side of the lake, 
the water comes together into a river again, the Ghost River, a great place to see wildlife and a truly incredible, incredible uh, canoeing experience as well. And this is the trail going through. Uh, this is one of the wide parts in, in the trail. The blue marks on the trees lead you through the Ghost River Canoe Trail. The place where I grew up in West Tennessee was uh, surrounded by a state forest called the Natchez Trace State Forest. Uh, there were four lakes within the 48,000 acres, one of the largest pieces of public property in West Tennessee. Uh, there are four lakes, two of which are managed as uh, public fishing areas by TWRA. This lake pictured is Cub Creek Lake, which is managed mainly for recreation with the, the paddle boats and uh, fish uh, are in there and fishing is one of the things that uh, people do at Cub Creek Lake. Uh, but uh, there are several other lakes in the Natchez Trace that you can go to. And it's become a really popular hunting area for the squirrels and for the deer. Uh, people come from East Tennessee to West Tennessee just to hunt at Natchez Trace. Uh, but I love the serenity of after the hunting season. Uh, there's a trail called the Red Leaves Trail. And this is the Red Leaves Trail beside Maple Creek Lake, one of the TWRA uh, public fishing lakes. Uh, this lake I have kind of a personal connection to because my foster grandfather worked on the WPA during the 1930s, one of the few jobs that he could find. And his job was to go about three miles from his home and help clear trees and build this lake, Maple Creek Lake. He bragged that he made twice as much as everybody else because he had a mule and the WPA paid him a dollar a day and they paid his mule a dollar a day. So he made his, the twice as much as uh, the other workers on the project. Today, th there is a large mammal the largest native mammal in North America lives there at Maple Creek Lake as all over the state. In the year 1960, there was not a single beaver anywhere in the state I've, I've read, but now they're everywhere. And they get a lot of complaints about the beaver. The beaver were reintroduced to Tennessee to provide a uh, fur trapping, uh, object of fur trapping. Fur trapping is uh, fallen out of favor. Not much of that goes on anymore, but the beaver are still here and they're chewing down our white oak trees like this one and um, kind of making a nuisance of themselves in some ways, but they create all sorts of wonderful new habitat for other wildlife. And I've, I've always heard that uh, TWRA gets more uh, complaint calls about the beavers than any other wildlife complaint. Um, I've also heard that they tell people that beaver taste really good. So uh, don't just get mad at them, have them for dinner. And the more calls they get, the better they taste. One very cold day, I walked at Natchez Trace uh, to see Maple Creek Lake. And I saw the, the flooded forest here that the beaver had created. And I looked up in the top of the, the snags and there were two nests up there. And I thought to myself, this could be something interesting. I don't know if they're big enough for an eagle. They don't look quite big enough for an eagle, but maybe they could be osprey nest. So I made a point of coming back two or three months later when the nesting would be going on. And they were not the nest of a bird of prey at all. Uh, they were the nest of something else. Uh, this is a tree that is more typical of their nesting habits. Uh, they, they nest in something people call rookeries, which they're not rooks, they're herons. They're great blue herons. So this is a heronry, you might say. Uh, rookery, heronry, whatever. But uh, this one is visible from the bridge across the Harpeth River on the Interstate 840 south of in Williamson County. A good place to come and see the, the great blue herons all standing on their nest in the early spring, uh, chatting with each other, I guess, about raising their babies. The great blue heron. Uh, pretty tall bird. 
pretty outstanding to see, pretty common. Uh, they are everywhere now. You can see them on ponds and lakes and streams everywhere in Tennessee. Uh, but I was disappointed that it was a heronry instead of an um, osprey nest or uh, eagle nest. Uh, this is a shot of Browns Creek Lake, the other TWRA fishing lake at Natchez Trace, where on a hot summer day, I was sitting in just about this location here. This is a winter shot, but on a hot summer day, I was sitting there and the water was not moving anywhere near as much as it is in this photograph. It was completely still, just a, a glass of the water, nothing, and it was hot. And I sat down for a break and splash, a big splash right out from me in the lake. And taking off from that splash was the osprey. Ospreys don't stay here in the winter. They uh, migrate down south, but in the hot summer days, they will dive right into the water and get that fish. And Browns Creek Lake was blessed with one that day, which startled me, gave me a shot of adrenaline that I'll never forget. I'll take you to the Tennessee National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, we're moving east across the state. Uh, the Tennessee Refuge has several different units up and down the, the north flowing part of the Tennessee and West Tennessee. And uh, uh, up near uh, Paris Landing State Park, they have the mineral wells out uh, underneath the water there. This is one of their large pieces of land that they manage. They have uh, overlooks and winter waterfowl extraordinaire. The Duck River unit is extraordinarily uh, beautiful in the wintertime with all the different birds you can see the Tennessee National Wildlife Refuge. Where I live now is a little park just west of Nashville called Montgomery Bell State Park. Uh, they are working on this spillway right as we speak and uh, I hope to get it ready in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I'm looking for leading a hike through there soon, so I hope they get it done in time. But Montgomery Bell is a, a little park that uh, has some beautiful wildlife areas too. The backwoods are great for bird watching. Uh, in the upper part of the, uh, or the lower part of it, in the south part, uh, is a wildflower area around Hall Spring. Uh, you can't see them very well, but over to the left, there are lots of bluebells on the spring day that we were looking at. Hall Spring is one of the most significant natural features of Montgomery Bell. A large uh, bunch of water comes out of the ground here and flows down into the Lake Woodhaven. One night, we went out to Hall Spring and look for these mounds of mud. My friend with a natural heritage came out to give us a little program. Those little mud volcanoes, we call them, were breathing holes for a critter. And he dug a, a, a hole down around one of those. And when he got the hole dug, the water filled it in. So he'd reached down into the water with his arm when people gathered around and came out, well, before he found anything, he had to feel around quite a bit. And he said to us, well, sometimes I find them and sometimes they find me. And then he came out with this little critter. Look at the faces on those kids. Oh my God, a new discovery. Very effective nature program. Here's our little guy, unique to the Western Highland Rim is the linear cobalt blue crayfish. You can find it along the Natchez Trace Parkway at Montgomery Bell and, and places like uh, Perry County and, and Wayne County, but uh, very few other places and nowhere else in the world besides our region. One day at Montgomery Bell, I was casual, kind of an off day. I was attending a conference and somebody came down the hill to the, the lodge there carrying a box. And my fellow rangers, and I looked at each other and said, I bet I know what's in that box, some sort of animal. Sure enough, when they came in, they had this barred owl in the box. His eyes were closed, it was lethargic. We all thought it didn't have long to go. So we said, okay, we'll do what we can for the bird. And the people left assured that these rangers were gonna do their best. We didn't know what to do really. Uh, but my friend at Radnor Lake, Leslie Ann, uh, came and um, took the bird to Radnor Lake with her. 
She put it in a cage and made it as comfortable as possible. And the next morning, she sent me a picture on the phone of that owl. During the night, with a little rest, he had recovered. And he became part of the, the fauna there, Radnor Lake, State Natural Area. One of the best places to see wildlife in Tennessee, right seven miles from downtown Nashville, Radnor Lake, State Natural Area. This guy was swooping at people. And he's got a, a white rabbit in this photograph. But we figured out eventually that this guy was swooping at people because of their, their, their little glasses holders, uh, thinking it was a tail, I guess, because he was so hungry. Or she, we're, we're not sure if it was a male or a female, but it had a swollen foot. It stopped swooping at people when its foot recovered. The barn owl. I, li I like to tell the story of um, my first day as a park ranger back 37 years ago. Uh, I walked out on the Fiery Gizzard Trail at South Cumberland where I first started working. And I sat at an overlook and looked out across this beautiful forest and the towering cliffs and thought to myself, wow, I have lucked out. And over to the left of me and over to the right of me, I heard, woo, woo, woo. The barred owl started calling. I counted seven barred owls across the gulf all around me there. It was like they were saying, welcome, Randy. Welcome, new ranger. Or that's what I thought anyway. Radnor Lake, a place where I spent nine years working as a ranger, showing people the barred owls that were sometimes really, really visible in the trees, uh, close by, not too far up. Uh, with just your eyes, you could, you could see them close up. Radnor Lake. The wildlife is so used to people. You can walk within a few feet of a deer and the deer will just look at you unless you step off the trail and do something unusual, of course, and then they will run off. But they are used to a steady stream of people going around and around the trails. And uh, it is a great place to see the common wildlife. And you can see, uh, this is a picture I took of uh, another oak hoot. Um, coots. They act like a duck. They kind of look like a duck, but they are not a duck. They are a wading bird. Um, they go, coo, 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 coo. This one was in the spillway at Radnor Lake. I have spent many an hour on the, the causeway there at Radnor uh, pointing out ducks and other things uh, that you can see around the lake. I would set up a telescope and do the conveyor belt interpretation where people come by and I would say, would you like to see the ducks up close? And we would look at them through the telescope. And the, the duck that I always liked to see the most was the wood duck. In my opinion, the most beautiful duck in the world. Uh, the Chinese would uh, take issue with that because its cousin, the Mandarin duck, is a little bit more spectacular than our wood duck, but this is ours. So I'm partial to this one, the wood duck, the most beautiful duck in Tennessee anyway, and I think in the world. The wood duck male doesn't have much to do with raising the babies. They're just too flamboyant. When the uh, nest up in a tree is hatching the eggs, the male is nowhere to be found around. And when the babies are dried off and ready to go, they are summoned out of the tree and they jump out and fall and bounce off the ground and it wakes them up to the reality of life. And mother wood duck and her babies go around until they are all grown up and then dad can rejoin them. Here is mama wood duck and the babies. Uh, somewhat of a constant companion when you're canoeing around Middle Tennessee. Uh, if you go around the curve and mother wood duck is there with her babies, she, she will do a, a loud noise, a, ha, 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 and the babies will scatter into the bushes and hide. Then she will pretend to have a broken wing trying to get you to come over to look at her. And, when you get close, of course, she takes off and the babies have been hidden. Now. Nearby Radnor is Warner Parks and one of my favorite parts of Warner Park is the, uh, the Harpeth River picnic areas. And there's a big open field behind some trees there where I always heard or saw the great horned owls. We had great horned owls at Radnor too, but uh, didn't seem to be as many as in the, the picnic area there at Warner Park. They 
my professor called them the tiger of the air. He called the barred owls the teddy bear of the air. But the great horned owl will eat anything smaller or even sometimes as big or bigger than it. Uh, they eat regularly skunks. If you smell skunk coming from high in a tree, you can bet that the skunk didn't go up there voluntarily. The great horned owl took it up there to have it for dinner. And the great horned owls don't ask who cooks for you. They're not interested in your culinary habits. They just want to know hoot, hooty hoot, hoot, hoot. <laughs> and the baby great horned owls are such a pile of fluff. And my friend David was able to find a nest one time and took a sequence of uh, pictures of great horned owls as they grew up. Wonderful sequence of pictures. When I arrived at Redner Lake, they told me that there were no otters and no turkey to be found in the area. And I said, maybe we can get some. Maybe we can get TWRA to bring us some reintroducing animals. And I asked, I was told I could go ask. And when I asked TWRA, they said, no, no, we're not giving you any because they're gonna arrive there eventually anyway. And sure enough, about three or four years after I arrived at Radnor Lake, so did the otters. And then Turkey about two or three years after that also arrived on their own. So uh, the flora and fauna of Radnor Lake uh, or Middle Tennessee is represented wonderfully at Radnor Lake. They have just about everything that you could find anywhere else. And the otters are really a special treat. They're not always there. Otters can travel 50 miles up a stream bed in one day if they want or need to. Uh, but what otter, self-respecting otter, could resist a 90-acre lake full of fish and no humans competing for them? So they come up a lot to Redner Lake and take advantage of the free fish. Here is one of the most diverse natural habitats in North America, according to the Nature Conservancy. This is the Duck River. The Duck River starts on the Cumberland Plateau and goes all the way across southern middle Tennessee and more species of mussel and fish than anywhere else in Tennessee and uh, one of the most biologically diverse places in North America, according to the Nature Conservancy. And I, I've had the great treat of uh, doing some programs there at Henry Horton State Park. Henry Horton State Park has a wonderful network of trails and some of which follow the, the Duck River, uh, a great place to bird watch or to see other animals uh, also along the Duck River. In northern middle Tennessee, we have a little park called Bledsoe Creek, which I've found to be a pretty good place to, to see the common birds. Uh, they have a paved trail for the handicapped. They have a pretty rugged trail through the back country, the Owl Hill Trail. Um, it's a good place, small park, but worth it. I remember leading a group of people on the, the paved trail one day and seeing quite a few of the, the more common birds. Here I am imitating uh, the tufted titmouse. Uh, yeah. And he came down and sang back to us and he fluffed his wings up and shook them and turned his head back and forth with his mouth open and we all tried to act like we were intimidated to give himself satisfaction. A teacher in a high school in Gallatin and her students started a campaign in the 1990s to name a state butterfly. And the state butterfly they suggested was the one that was eventually voted in, the zebra swallowtail. You can see those at Bledsoe Creek State Park as well because there are pawpaw trees there. Wherever you have pawpaws, you may have the, uh, ha you have the habitat anyway, for zebra swallowtail, one of the most beautiful butterflies, our state butterfly. Long Hunter State Park is a great place to go in the winter time to see a bird that you don't usually get to see in Tennessee. On these bluffs on the side of the volunteer trail, uh, you can sit with your binoculars or your telescope and look out across the lake and you may see a large floating bird that disappears into the water and then pops back up yards and yards away from where they went down. The common loon. Loons come down for the wintertime and you can see them in Percy Priest Lake from the bluffs at Long Hunter State Park. 
Uh, also a good place to see the herons and other birds uh, when they lower the lake level in the wintertime. There's a new trail along the rocks along the shore of the lake. And it seems that all the deer at Radnor Lake and Long Hunter and Bledsoe Creek have twins. And I have read that happy deer have twins. So our deer are happy. That means they're well fed, they got a good, safe, secure habitat. Uh, the deer all over our parks in Middle Tennessee are quite happy. One of the most extraordinary little uh, walks that I've ever had was with a the seasonal naturalist at Long Hunter State Park to see or hear the goat suckers. Goat suckers are night birds that fly around eating uh, the bugs. They have nothing to do with goats, really. Uh, but the pioneers, when they went to milk their goats, these birds were usually flying around and they thought they were there to steal milk from their goats. Um, but there's one that's kind of small who goes and there's a, a bigger one that goes the one in the picture here is the one in the family that wasn't blessed with a good singing voice their uh, call is usually to display and impress the girls they don't sing they dive and throw their wings out at the last minute before they hit the ground, which makes a booming sound. So they're called boom bats sometimes, or common nighthawk most of the other times. And they lay their eggs right on the gravel. No nest building necessary for this guy. Their eggs are camouflaged in the gravel and they just lay them right on top of the gravel. Burgess Falls, one of our uh, state natural areas moving east on the eastern Highland Rim. Beautiful waterfall, great river going down into Center Hill Lake. You can canoe almost up to the, the base of this waterfall, see wildlife along the way in the Falling Water River. But we have a wonderful butterfly garden there at Burgess Falls uh, that attracts all sorts of pollinators, not just butterflies, and it's a great wildflower walk as well. Here is the guy that don't like heat, the morning cloak butterfly. Morning cloak butterflies can be active any month of the year, but the months they most likely will not be seen would be July and August. They seem to hate hot weather. They will bed down somewhere underneath the bark of a tree or some other cool place that they can find and wait it out. And they are one of the longest lived butterflies that you can see in Tennessee as well. The morning cloak named because it looks like the, the uh, the covering that women would wear during funerals in the old days. And in uh, the last month or so, we've had several of these, the monarchs coming through Tennessee, the long migrating four generations it takes to make the full migration monarchs. I hope the ones that are coming through in the last few weeks have made it through already or on their way on down through Texas and on down into the mountains of Mexico where they will spend the winter, the monarch. And the hummingbirds are mostly gone. This is my favorite wildflower, the cardinal flower, which hummingbirds almost find irresistible, the red flowers and the nectaring. This is a new pursuit for people that you might not realize, uh, watching the dragonflies. Uh, dragonflies are many and varied. But don't be fooled by the, the people that say that damselflies are the females and dragonflies are the males. That's not true. There are different species, okay? There are male damselflies and female dragonflies. Got it? And uh, these guys, you can tell a dragonfly from a damselfly by looking at how they hold their wings when they're sitting. And this guy has the wings spread out, ready to take flight. That's a dragonfly. If they fold them daintily back behind them, that's a damselfly. The park where I worked most of my career as a state park ranger was South Cumberland State Park. We had thousands of acres of public land, including Stone Door that you see here in Savage Gulf, the Fiery Gizzard, and several other places. And we seldom saw wildlife because we had so many thousands of acres that the wildlife could hide pretty easily from us. 
Radnor Lake, everything squeezed down into 1,000 acres, and it's likely you will see some animals. At Stone Door, you're not likely to see some animals. But I have seen uh, several different things during my tenure there. I was there for 16 years. So I saw lots of birds in the spring and fall migrations, and even saw bobcat and, and other mammals in the area as well. And some little critters, like this guy, just bigger than a nickel, the red-spotted newt. And you might be able to tell what season it is by looking around him and seeing the male pine cones there, the ones that produce the pollen. So it's springtime with the male pine cones and the red-spotted newt out walking around. You can bet that something that's orange with red spots is trying to tell you something that is toxic. Yeah, don't try to eat me. You will, I will be the last one you'll ever eat, you might say. And here is the answer to our question that we had earlier, the Tennessee state reptile. The yellow marks on the back of the box turtle are unique to an individual. There's no two box turtles that have the exact same pattern on their back. And you can tell the males from the females, but the, the males have red eyes and, uh, well, they both have the yellow marks on their back. And we have a special butterfly. This is a bad picture, but this is the Diana fritillary uh, butterfly. This is the male. The female is uh, kind of, looks like the uh, spice bush swallowtail, the black and blue looking uh, butterfly. But these butterflies only live in the Southern Appalachians on the Cumberland Plateau, the moist, uh, rich, uh, green areas of the Cumberland Plateau and the Smokies, uh, you can find the, the Dianas. And people come from all over the world, the butterfly lovers from all over the world, come to our neck of the woods to see the Dianas, a big draw. I love the Cumberland Plateau. It goes across Tennessee from Kentucky down to Alabama and these cliffs along the way. There is a salamander that only lives in uh, cliffs along the plateau and, and uh, on the eastern Highland Rim uh, in among the rock le ledges, the green salamander. My friend here and I were exploring our new state area called Pogue Creek Canyon State Natural Area. And we were walking along underneath the bluff, bluff here, uh, enjoying the spectacular rock shelter that we were in. And we saw the biggest pile of bear poop we've ever seen in that rock shelter and it looked really fresh. So the rest of the trip, we were a little bit uh, anxious, not knowing if we were gonna come around a bend in the rock there and encounter a black bear. Black bear are resident on the North Plateau. Pickett State Park, Big South Fork, Pogue Creek Canyon, there are resident bears giving birth to the young and moving every year into new territory on down the, the Cumberland Plateau. Here's an animal that very few people love. But my father-in-law made uh, a whole study out of these guys. He was trying to study bird flight. His name was Dr. Charles Farrell, worked as a zoology professor at Vanderbilt for many years. And one of the things he studied was bird flight. And he found the perfect subject for studying bird flight was vultures, black vultures in particular. They're very social. These guys are hanging out together in this group. Uh, but uh, turkey vultures were too difficult to deal with. They were solitary and they tended to use their defenses whenever he went to the cage, which is projectile vomiting. You don't want to be projectile vomited on by a vulture. <laughs> Black vultures actually grew used to people and turned into pets. Dr. Farrell had one that he kept in his house. It was such a pet. And it would untie his shoes and he would all the time be kicking it out of the way, saying, go away, go away, damn it, go away. So the name of the bird became damn it. And Mrs. Farrell, after uh, the professor passed away, kept a picture of that vulture on her mantle for years and years. Uh, they do the world a service by cleaning up the dead animals. These guys don't have a sense of smell. Turkey vultures do. One of the few birds that has a, a good sense of smell. That was proved by John James Audubon of all people. He did a study where he put out a carcass 
and the turkey vultures and the black vultures both found it, the black vultures following the turkey vultures. He then put a carcass underneath a cover where it could not be seen from above and the turkey vultures found it anyway. And then the black vultures came later. That proved that the turkey vultures indeed had a sense of smell to find their food. Let's go to East Tennessee now where Harrison Bay State Park down near Chattanooga is our first Tennessee State Park. And Harrison Bay on the Tennessee River is a very good place to see wildlife of all sorts, good fishing area. And it's pretty close to one of the outstanding nature experiences that you can have in Tennessee, which is uh, the Hawassi Refuge up uh, in near Dayton, Tennessee, where the sandhill cranes come down by the hundreds in the wintertime and populate all over that uh, peninsula over there and fly around giving their, their distinctive call. Oh, what a thrill, the sandhill cranes. And last year, I think they had some uh, uh, whooping cranes along with the sandhills. So it's a great place to go in the wintertime. Starting in early December would be a good time to go down to the Hawassi State Wildlife Refuge, north of Chattanooga, off Highway 60, to see the sandhill cranes and maybe a whooping crane. This is the bird that I got closest to when I went there. This is Phoebe, named after its song. Phoebe, 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 Phoebe. They nest in the most beautiful places. They have the best taste in home sites that I know of, any bird. Every, every waterfall, every cave mouth, every overhanging cliff has a Phoebe nest. And they like sandhill cranes too, apparently. They nest there at the Hawassi Refuge. East Tennessee has several reservoirs, and uh, this is Cherokee Reservoir, where we have a little state park called Panther Creek State Park. The islands are refuges for animals. The shoreline is a great place to see birds. But the, the animal that I saw closest and was most thrilled by was the camp stealer here who came right up to me and, and tried to get whatever I was holding out of my hand. Uh, these raccoons are moochers. Yeah, little bear or uh, what do they call them? Uh, trash pandas, yeah. We love our raccoons in Tennessee. It's our Tennessee state animal, do you know that? Yeah. And my friend up in, Kingsport, Tennessee took this picture of a yellow-throated vireo feeding its baby. Uh, how he got it, I don't know, but uh, Marty Silver up in Kingsport at Warriors Pass State Park took this picture. I love the mountains of East Tennessee and uh, wildlife watching can be very, very lucrative over there. Walking the grassy balls of Roan Mountain, great place to see some birds you might not see in other places in Tennessee. Uh, you can see the slate-colored juncos uh, you can see several birds that live further north, but only come to Tennessee in the wintertime, you might, or on top of Rome in the summer. And some unique animals of other kinds, like this. This is an Appalachian cottontail, only found in the high elevations of the, uh, the Blue Ridge in Tennessee and, and nowhere else in the state. And here's the red squirrel. Red squirrels are only found in the high elevations. The picture of the, the bunny and the squirrel here were both taken in the picnic area on top of Roan Mountain, above our Roan Mountain State Park on the National Forest land. And of course the deer love it everywhere in Tennessee. Now, what a success story that is. 1930, there were said to be only 200 white-tailed deer in the entire state of Tennessee. We almost lost them too, but now they're everywhere. And these, these guys have an advantage in having no scent. At Radnor Lake, people all the time coming in saying, there's a, there's a baby deer, he's right next to the trail. Well, the mother deer figured the safest place for, for her baby to, to lie down and be still would be right next to the trail where the people are always walking and never hurting anybody. And these guys, if a dog comes along, the dog usually can't find it because there's no scent on a baby deer on the fawn. Here's some of my friends doing what we do as rangers. There's a couple of rangers on the right there that are taking kids out into a creek and showing them wildlife that exists on the bottom of rocks. The insect larvae and, and the crayfish and, and other things that you can find in a stream. This is at Roan Mountain State Park, uh, the junior ranger program uh, where we get 
kids started off on the right foot, loving the outside, loving nature, and showing them little tiny things that they never knew existed and are signs of a good stream. One of the thrills I had going to East Tennessee was visiting the Bays Mountain Nature Park one cold winter day. Got this picture and got this picture of the bobcat cage. They had quite a menagerie of uh, captive animals there, including a bobcat and a, and a gray wolf and, and several other things. So if you're ever in Kingsport, Tennessee, it's worth your time to go by Bays Mountain Wildlife Sanctuary, take a walk around the lake, and then go through their little native animal zoo. Oh, back to beaver. Yep, even on Bays Mountain, they got problems with those big uh, rodents. You know, common wildlife in your yard. If you're living in Tennessee and you've got a, a yard of any kind, you probably have these guys. This is the American toad, and they make quite a ruckus in the spring. Uh, this one is in a drainage pipe coming out of my gutter at my house here in Dixon County. And robins, I mean, who doesn't have robins around? And there's one thing you can maybe say about the robin that uh, might surprise people. You can look at this guy, well, is it a guy? Is this a male or a female? You know how you tell? The head of the male is black. So yes, this is a male robin. Most people don't know that. The females are just gray headed. And red tailed hawks and other birds of prey are housed at lots of our parks across the state. Radnor Lake having one of the best selections. You go up to their environmental education center, they got red tailed hawks, they got uh, bald eagles all of which were injured in some way and cannot be released. But you can go see them in their cages or sometimes participate in a program where they bring them out and you can take pictures like this. But watch out as you're driving around Tennessee. Some of our wildlife could get into drinking. <laughs> I did not stage this photograph. I found this armadillo in the middle of the Highway 70 coming from Waverly one day. And somebody had propped up the Dr. Pepper bottle in its poor little front paws there. I don't think it died from Dr. Pepper. Mm. They have, have the unfortunate uh, defensive uh, behavior of jumping straight up when startled by a car, which is not good news when the car is coming really fast. All right. Thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the pictures tonight. And are there any questions or comments? Ah, oh, I see somebody clapping. Thank you. <laughs> it's very nice of you. I don't know how much time I could, took. I didn't even watch the clock. Yeah, no, that was great. Um, if you want to stop sharing, we can go to gallery view and people can drop questions in the chat or ask them out loud. Okay. Cool. Yeah, if you guys have any questions, you can put them in the chat if you'd rather not speak them out. Uh, it looks like my time went about right. Yeah, that's great. 8, 801 now, so just a little bit less than an hour. Anybody got any questions? Comments? Complaints? I was kind of wondering um, why do you think the otters returned or came, I guess, to Radnor Lake? What brought them? Uh, well, the story goes back to the same the same statistic that I quoted earlier about the uh, the beaver in 1960. There were there were no otters or, or beaver in Tennessee, and they they brought some uh, otters up from Louisiana and released them in Tennessee, uh, and they've been expanding ever since. They put them in the largest rivers, and when their babies uh, tried to establish new territories, they went upstream. So eventually, they worked their way into the headwaters of several of our large uh, of our streams, including Otter Creek, which is named because there were so many otters there in the past. Uh, but now there are otters in it again. Otter Creek is a tributary of the Harpeth River, and Otter Creek's headwaters are what? above Radnor Lake. That's how they got there, and it just took them a while. Nineteen. Uh, 99, I believe it was, or 
That answer your question? Yes, thank you. Was that like a conservation goal of the state parks? And if so, like why do you think? No, it never was a goal of the state parks to bring back um, those animals. Uh, TWRA is almost solely responsible for bringing them back, uh, setting them up to um, populate again the areas that they had formerly occupied. So state parks are happy. We're thrilled that they have come into our parks and, and set up a residence again. Uh, but uh, it wasn't something that we worked toward. We just uh, were running their habitat until they arrived. Is there, uh, is there a deer of overpopulation? There are uh, pockets of um, the state where deer are a little bit overpopulated, yes. Uh, you can see a browse line in some forest where all the, the small twigs and things are eaten by the deer. That's a sign that they're, they're uh, out, out eating their food source. They, they're resorting to foods that they wouldn't normally eat. Uh, so yes, there are a few places where the deer are uh, a little overpopulated. The tool that we use uh, to deal with that though is, is hunting. hunting. Uh, I know that, uh, mm -hmm. Hunting is an uh, unpopular subject with some folks, but uh, hunting is an almost um, indispensable uh, tool to uh, work on the, the population of deer or other animals that get in that shape. Um, we, we eliminated the, the normal predators of deer that kept them in check in the past. That would be cougars. So we don't have cougars much in Tennessee. No. We have few, maybe. But, um, we have to be the predator. We have to regulate the deer population ourselves. What is the disease that deer have called wasting disease? Chronic wasting disease? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I've, I've heard of that and I experienced uh, a float down the Piney River in Hickman County uh, last year where there were so many um, deer carcasses it made it kind of unpleasant. Um, oh. and, they told me that it was because of the chronic wasting disease that so many deer had died. So once in a while, that is a controlling factor, the disease. So is that, is that caused by a virus or a that I pathogen? Can't or? That, that, that is beyond my skill set there. We would have to contact uh, TWRA and uh, biologists to find out that. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. So there's a few questions in the chat. Kelly asked, what are your favorite birds that come here in the winter time? Uh, the, uh, the sandhill crane has got to be top of the list uh, when, they, when they come down from up in Nebraska or uh, up in Canada and spend the winter with us. It's always a thrill. Um, and um, it's, it's great in the wintertime uh, to see owls and I, I love uh, going out in the wintertime and, and seeing the owls, even though they're here year round. They're not as visible in the summertime, of course. Uh, in the wintertime, I get to see them more often. And uh, they start nesting in like February. So uh, a winter nester, the, the owls. Hmm. And we, uh, something else uh, I just thought of is uh, bluebirds. Most people think bluebirds are migratory, but uh, a lot of bluebirds stay here uh, during the winter. Um, my professor of birds at UT Martin studied eastern bluebirds and found nest boxes with a dozen bluebirds all hanging out in the box trying to keep each other warm during the winter. And in the wintertime, they, they exist off berries. Uh, their favorite food he found through uh, stomach analysis was sumac, sumac berries. So it's always a thrill to see the bluebirds in the wintertime uh, just barely getting by, put out some sumac berries for them. Is there another one on the chat that I didn't see? Um, yeah, someone asked, where is the best place to take children to hike? Oh, well, you can't beat Radnor Lake, uh, but uh, uh, the, the parks that I mentioned around Nashville, the Warner Parks and uh, Long Hunter and uh, Bledsoe Creek State Park up at, near Gallatin is always a great place to take kids. Uh, so there are a lot of parks around Nashville and in Middle Tennessee that are great for kids. The South Cumberland, where I used to work, uh, some of the trails are pretty rugged. 
So you might want to not take young children to things like the Fiery Gizzard Gorge or down into Savage Gulf Canyon. But uh, there are trails that would be good for kids even there. The trail out to Stone Door, as long as you keep a handle on them out there on that 200 foot bluff, <laughs> now, it's a good trail for them too. No, no, got another one. Um, yep, Diane said, when is the hike at Montgomery Bell that you're leading? Oh, uh, been reading about me, I guess. Uh, yes, yeah, so I got uh, three hikes coming up at Montgomery Bell uh, for the Tennessee Trails Association on the 23rd, 24th, and 25th. Uh, Friday the 23rd, we're meeting at the park office at three for about a three or four mile walk. And then on Saturday, a good six and a half, seven mile walk starting at 9 a.m. from the park office. And then on Sunday, another four to five mile trip starting at 9 a.m. from the trailhead there at the backcountry trailhead at the maintenance warehouse. Um, I'm also leading a trip for the Foresters next week uh, at here at Montgomery Bell. Um, the Forestry Association is coming up. I don't know if they want other people to come, but uh, uh, I'm leading one for them as well. But those on the 23rd, 24th, and 25th, you would sign up with TTA. You need to call the TTA and register. We're, tr we're going to try to limit the amount of people going on those trips so that the trip will be more enjoyable for those that come. If you get m many more than 15 people, they don't, uh, people don't enjoy the, the, the walk, the guided walk. These are nature walks. They're not marches or walks, or hikes. So we'll stop. And if I got more than 15 people, it's kind of hard to arrange everybody to tell them about the tree. So we're going to try to limit the group. Uh, uh, go to the TTA website and find out how to register for those hikes. Okay. Something else? That was all from the chat. I was, oh, what, go ahead, what's Diane. The, oh, what's the most rugged hike in your opinion? In your opinion? Um, well, I have more than one uh, that would fit that. Um, the Fiery Gizzard Gorge is probably one of the roughest hikes that you can imagine, really. It's just a, a big pile of rocks and you're climbing across it and you go down into the canyon, then had to climb 500 vertical feet back up out of the canyon across all those rocks. Um, the connector trail at Savage Gulf is almost as, as difficult. Um, so those rocky trails on the side of the mountains in South Cumberland are my idea of the, the roughest trails that we have in Tennessee. There are probably some in the Smokies that I haven't experienced. It may be rougher, but those at Savage Gulf and Fire Gizzard are the toughest I've, I've been on. Anything else? Do you have a favorite um, camping spot? <laughs> uh, gosh, I'd have to give that some thought, but uh, I love to camp at Savage Gulf. It's still my favorite place. Uh, and I love to go up to uh, Fall Creek Falls and the, the walk-in camping areas. Um, Marge said, what do you think is the biggest threat to Tennessee's parks and outdoors? Well, this year it has become overuse. Um, we oh. have been overwhelmed with so much uh, traffic that it's become very difficult to keep the, the uh, parks clean or safe. Uh, we're doing our best and trying to ride herd on the, the hordes of people that are coming to the parks. You know, in any other time, we would say, great, more people discovering state parks. Uh, but uh, it has been so overwhelming. I mean, it's incredible when you get a 30 car parking lot and you got 300 cars pour, uh, pouring in. Uh, what are you going to do with all that? So uh, it has become kind of a nightmare scenario for a lot of our rangers, especially in places like Radnor Lake and Burgess Falls that are so heavily overused already. And uh, then all of the, um, the use from people wanting to get out. I can't blame them for wanting to get out, uh, but uh, please be nice to our parks. We're, we're a little bit crowded out there. Okay. 
All right. All right. Thank you all. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone.